Uh, yes. And then, yeah, if you want to start the YouTube video. So record to the cloud. Yes. So let me phone. They're all coming. Okay. Right, hi everyone. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay, just like raise your hand in the chat or anything. If uh, anything's a bit unclear. Um, hi, welcome everybody uh, in the room and online to the Stolten Seminar. This week it's on uh, nuclear in Latin America and small modular, modular reactors in Canada. Um, if everybody online could mute yourself, please. And also just be aware this is being live streamed um, on YouTube as well. Um, so yeah, um, without further ado, yeah, thank you for all coming. Uh, I'll introduce my fir the first speaker. This is Alice Kuna de Silva. She will be giving a talk on nuclear power in Latin America. So some background on Alice. Alice graduated from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in nuclear engineering with honors. She has a master's degree in business administration and management and an MBA in project management. Alice is currently key account engineer at West Housing Electric Company. She was winner of the WNU uh, Nuclear Olympiad at the IAEA, received a certificate of honor, um, Admiral Alvaro Alberto, for services provided in the Brazilian nuclear industry, and is the youngest member of the, of the Board of Brazilian Association of Nuclear Energy. Um, so if you wanna take it away, Alice. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I wanna like the opportunity to speak a little bit of um, an overview of nuclear in Latin America. Um, and I know it's not, uh, it's a topic that often is overlooked to what's happening in nuclear in, in this region of the world. So I'm excited to be able to share a bit of that with you. I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay. So just an overview, a very fast overview. I'm gonna focus on nuclear power on, on but I just I wanted to make sure um, to give an overview of what is happening in, in nuclear in general. So uh, only three countries out of Latin America have nuclear uh, reactors uh, for generation of electricity, which is Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina. And at Westinghouse, I work with these three countries. Um, and I'm located in, in Rio in, uh, in Brazil right now. Uh, well, not today, but <laughs> that's what I'm based on. Uh, but Besides the, the nuclear power, uh, several countries around Latin America have research reactors and have projects on medicine or, or agriculture. Uh, so there is around 17 different uh, nuclear research reactors across different countries of this region. And right now, Bolivia, though doesn't have a nuclear reactor, is one of the countries in Latin America with the biggest project in the, in the medical field. Um, they are, they are working, well, they were working with the Russians for the development of uh, atomic center for medicine, for nuclear medicine um, in Bolivia to supply radioisotopes and other researches for that country. So it's an incoming country in that area and not nuclear power, but uh, nuclear medicine and research. So in Brazil, I'm gonna focus on the three countries that have nuclear power. Uh, Brazil, Mex Argentina, and Mexico. In Brazil right now, we have two reactors in operation, Angra 1 and Angra 2. Uh, the utility which manages these reactors are Electronuclear, that's the name, um, and they are state-owned uh, utility. In, in Brazil, uh, like many other countries, nuclear is run by the government. Uh, so it's a state-owned company that has the, the responsibility of construction and, and 
uh, operation of the plants. Uh, so Engra One is started in the 80s um, and is right now undergoing life extension to go to 20 more years of operation. The license of Engra One finishes in 2024 and it's uh, in process now with the regulator to have more 20 years uh, of operation to supply energy. Uh, Engra Two is started in, 20, um, in 2001. Uh, so it still has some time to go because the license is of, of for 40 years. Um, but the idea of the Brazil government is to also go through life extension with, when it's time of Engra Two. At least the idea of the Korean government is, is to do that. These plants are located in Rio. And they, the site was selected to, because it was close to big centers of consume in Brazil, which is the southeast of the country. That has Sao Paulo, Rio, Minas Gerais, which are the uh, most populated and industrialized sort of region in, in the country. So there is the need for more energy there. So that's why the site was selected strategically to be uh, close to these big centers of, con of, of electricity consume. The technology uh, selected for that in, in the 50s, 60s in Brazil was PWR. So Engra 1 is a Westinghouse technology and Engra 2 is a German technology actually, because back in the 70s, Brazil did an agreement with the Germans to build eight new plants um, and develop other areas uh, like fuel manufacturing and so on. And unfortunately, out of these eight plants, only Engra 2 was constructed and with some delay. And Engra 3, which is a sister plant of Engra 2, um, that was supposed to be constructed at the same site, uh, suffered many delays and ended up only starting construction actually in 2010 and had the issue in 2015, they ran out of money. Um, so the construction is stopped by this year. Uh, not this year, 2021, uh, it was a bid tender process and they will restart construction uh, of Engra 3 this year. And, and it was finalized, they, they are signing the contract and, and this is finally happening, uh, which is great because when I started college, I thought this was gonna be ready by the time that I finish, it was not, um, unfortunately, but now it, it's undergoing the process of, restarting construction of Engra 3. And it's going to be at the same site. These three plants, these two plants, uh, Engra 1 and Engra 2, currently provide 3% of the energy of the country. And Brazil is a huge country. We have 215 million people. Uh, it's the fifth, fifth largest country in the world in terms of land. Um, so it seems a little. But when you look at Rio, uh, Rio has 7 million, Rio de Janeiro has 7 million people, the city, and these two plants supply enough energy for 40% of that. So it's, it's quite a big amount. Uh, and Ingrid 3 will, will come with 1400 megawatts. So it's going to be a, a large plant to supply much more. Uh, besides this, in Brazil, there is other characteristics. Brazil is very rich in uranium. Uh, back in the 60s, 70s, when we first started doing uh, research in the, in the country to look for uh, uranium, Brazil was posted as the 60th largest uranium reserves of the world uh, because we didn't go look for more. <laughs> um, this position uh, is now a nine, but we have not, we have only researched 30% of the country. So we have very large reserves of uranium. Uh, part of the uh, process of developing, uh, uh, like with the Brazil German agreements in the past, we were able to develop the technology to do fuel manufacturing. And the Navy in Brazil developed its own enrichment technology. So Brazil has the capability to mine uranium and, and the enrich uranium in the country as well. And that's that's what the country does. Uh, so we don't buy uh, fuel from outside. Of course, that depends on, on if the mines are producing and so on. So for a while, we, 
Brazil was uh, dealing with uh, uh, some environmental mitigation and was needing to buy uranium for that side. But just for a licensing perspective, uh, and now the license has been uh, reinstated to a new, uh, what they call anomaly inside the, the, the mine. And then it's producing uranium again. And all of that is the responsibility of another state-owned company in Brazil, which is called Industrias Nucleares do Brasil, which is INB. And they do the mining, the enrichment, and the fuel manufacture. As part of the nuclear fuel cycle, currently the only thing that is done outside of Brazil is the conversion. So we do mining, milling, enrichment, fuel fabrication, and all the rest uh, of electricity generation and so on. Just the conversion portion that we sent yellow cake outside to transform into UF6 uh, to come back to Brazil. And with UF6, we go through the centrifuge for the enrichment process in the country. Um, so it's, it's, and we do have the technology for conversion. We just don't have the conversion plant. And that is a plan that Brazil has had for a while to also build uh, the commercial plant so we can have this uh, portion done in country. Uh, another thing that was recently announced and that I'm very excited about is the plans for a fourth plant. Oh, sorry, it's plans for a fourth plant. There was just recently announced, there was a meeting yesterday actually, uh, that they announced a fourth plant up to 2031. Yeah, 2031, yes, that's correct. Um, and it's supposed to be another larger plant. Uh, site selection has started in a research mode that needs to have approval in the Congress and all of that because it, everything in Brazil in the nuclear is, is it has to go through the government. Um, so there's still a lot to define. But the, the Brazilian government announced that there is plans for a new nuclear power plant after Angra 3. And Angra 3 is supposed to start operation um, in 2026. That's when it is uh, now defined that the commercial operation is going to start. Of course, that will depend on finalizing the construction, which the civil construction is about 60% ready uh, with several other areas already done but it still needs to finalize the containment building, put the equipments there and, and a bunch of things to and commission the plants and do the tests and so on. Uh, but yeah, it, it's exciting that the country is looking to expand the nuclear sector with a fourth plant. And the, in Brazil, we have a, a company that does energy planning and this company is also from, from the government and they, do a research analysis of what is the expe expectation of demand, um, growth in demand, how we are gonna attend that in, in the following years. So they did the analysis up to 2050. And by 2050, they oversee that we are gonna need eight to 10 more gigawatts of nuclear power. Um, and this means much more reactors and they are looking out also not only at the technology that we already have, but SMRs in the future, because Brazil is a large country and it is has a lot of uh, faraway communities that could benefit from SMRs and micro reactors. Uh, one characteristic also that is something that um, we as nuclear professionals in the country are advocating is because, because of the situation of halting certain projects in Brazil. Um, there was a lack of hiring during a long time. And we have now right now an aging workforce. And there's an issue that we need to address by bringing in new blood to the nuclear industry and giving them opportunities to, to work in the industry so we can actually fulfill all these projects there are, are, are for the future. Uh, but yeah, but right now the, the average age uh, in, of the worker in nuclear in Brazil is very high uh, due to this situation. As I said, Angra 3, for example, was supposed to be constructed back when we had uh, the agreement with Germany in the 80s and we are in 2022 and has not finalized yet. So um, this big delay caused the, the industry to not hire people 
Um, and so right now we are dealing with that, but this is an issue that needs to be sorted out for us to be able to achieve all these projects uh, that the government is putting forward. I just wanna make sure I give an overview on Brazil, uh, but I don't wanna stay much more because I can talk about nuclear in Brazil for two hours. <laughs> Um, so going to Argentina, uh, Argentina uh, has a utility called NASA, which is Nuclear, Nuclear Electric Argentina, which often is mistaken when we're talking about, oh, I, was, I was talking with NASA, people don't immediately think it's the utility in Argentina. Um, they have three reactors, Embalse, Atucha 1 and 2. Uh, Embalse is a can-do technology. And I don't know what happened with this many PRs. I'm sorry, <laughs> I need to fix that. But uh, Atucha 1 and 2 are heavy water uh, reactors, but they are not can do their Siemens plans. Uh, so they are heavy water uh, PWRs uh, from the German design. Uh, Argentina decided long, long time ago that they would not want to use enriched uranium. So they went to uh, uh, the heavy water reactor technology. They have an agreement right now with China, a government to government agreement to construct the fourth plant. Uh, and they agreed with China to construct a Wallong design. Wallong design is a PWR and it is gonna be a new technology for Argentina. Uh, but they are also thinking of constructing a Tucha 3 which would be a, a heavy water reactor. Um, there is a lot of people in Argentina advocating for a new uh, heavy water reactor because they own a lot of the technology uh, and they have a very robust nuclear industry in Argentina, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but the agreement with China is for financing and construction the, Wal the Walong design, which is a Chinese design. Uh, and they have recently, the, early this year, finally signed the contract. The agreement was made a while ago, uh, uh, four years ago or something, but they finally signed the, the contract with China this year. And Argentina is basically used more fossil fuels as a, as a source of, of uh, energy. They use a lot of gas and nuclear is around 5%. Uh, uh, for the country. Other characteristics of Argentina, as I said, they have a very robust lo local industry. So Conoir and Fai, which is the same company, one but the other, manufactures few and other components. So, so they also produce their own fuel for, for their reactors in Argentina. Although they don't, they need to buy the uranium from outside. Uh, and they have less problems buying because they don't need to buy enriched uranium, it's, it's uh, non-enriched. But they do locally produce um, odd components, tubes. Uh, they have uh, welding capabilities, which in, in nuclear, uh, nuclear welding is, is a very specific skill. And they do have that. And they manufacture uh, Conoir. It's, it's a very large location with capabilities of manufacturing several components to they can do and, and have water reactor design that they have. Um, and they also have INVAP. INVAP is located in Bariloche, which I would put in my bucket list to visit. <laughs> it is a gorgeous place um, with mountains are all over and it's, it's just beautiful. And they are a technology exporter, actually. They have the capability to export nuclear research reactors a power reactor in Australia is an a INVAP reactor. They are currently uh, working on the Palace project that is a research reactor in the Netherlands. They have exported their, their research reactor to other places in, in the Middle East. And they are also working with Brazil for the multi-purpose reactor, which is a research reactor folk, more focused on uh, radioisotopes production for medicine. Uh, it is also an INVAP-based project. So they, they, they have developed a capability to export their own technology to other, other countries. 
they also export satellites. So they construct satellites for NASA, for example, and NASA aerospace <laughs> company, not NASA utility in Argentina. <laughs> so they, they do export satellites uh, as well. They do uh, radars, they work for the aerospace industry uh, out of out of this location that has the picture here in Bariloche in Argentina. Another thing that Argentina is developing is they have their own design of SMR, which is the Cutting 25, that is owned by the uh, Nuclear Energy Commission of Argentina. And they are, this is local, this is local technology as well. This is Argentinian technology. And their SMR is right now under construction uh, in Argentina, yeah, around Buenos Aires, the area that is under construction. They do also services for the plants. So for example, NASA, the utility in Argentina has professionals doing inspections at the plants in Angra. And one characteristics of Brazil and Argentina is there is a binational company called organization that is called ABAC, which is the Brazilian Argentinian Organization for Control of Nuclear Materials. So it is, it is to focus on non-proliferation. Uh, so as the, the regulator has the safeguards um, and IEA has also the safeguards ex experts that do inspections in all this, Brazil and Argentina has this third extra uh, 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 inspection sort of uh, organization for safeguards. So not only um, we have the local inspectors of the regulator and the IE inspection uh, safeguards. Uh, we also have the Brazilian Argentinian uh, organization. So the Brazilians inspect the Argentinian facilities and then the Argentinians inspect the Brazilian facilities. And this has been used by IEA as a reference of implementing the non-proliferation treats because uh, these two countries went to one step above all the others by having this third uh, organization doing these, these as well and uh, making sure everything is being done uh, properly like it's supposed to. So in Mexico, there is uh, the utility CFE. CFE is uh, Central Federal de Electricidade, Comissão Federal de Electricidade. Uh, CFE is actually responsible for uh, all the electricity generated in Mexico, not only nuclear, they do have all the other uh, 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 utilities for fossil fuels, renewables, and so on. It's all uh, uh, for CF CFE is responsible. Uh, they do have two reactors, two nuclear reactors, which is Laguna Verde 1 and 2. Uh, the technology is BWR, they are GE plants. Uh, and they are currently discussing potential new plants. Uh, Laguna Verde One has recently uh, undergone life extension and they have uh, received license for 30 more years of operation. And Laguna Verde Two is, is going through that process as well. Uh, so they will be producing up to 2050. Uh, well, one and then two is gonna be a little further. They are located in Veracruz, which is one of the most industrialized states of, of, of Mexico. Uh, Mexico is also very reliant on fossil fuels. It is more than 75% uh, of the economy and nuclear is around 4% of Mexico. But when you narrow down to Veracruz, uh, it's much more, uh, the, the nuclear is like 20 something percent of Veracruz. Uh, but Mexico is very relying on, on, on fossil fuels. And currently in Mexico, they, they are not, they don't seem very concerned with uh, changing that scenario, even though we are talking about uh, uh, climate change and migrate into energy transition and going through um, uh, de uh, decreasing fossil fuels and, and changing for clean energy. Uh, Mexico is still very focused on fossil fuels. Uh, it is a large portion of the economy. They import a lot of gas from the US. When Houston had that issue, um, 
I think a couple of years ago that they they had the, the in in Texas that issue of um, uh, problems with electricity and heat and, and so on. They stopped selling to Mexico for a while, and it was a crisis in Mexico. So they are very reliant on buying buying gas from US, which is not very good. So they they want to change that. And so they are still very focused on, on, on fossil fuels. Um, they are discussing potential new plants, but they have been discussing for a while and things have not moved much. Uh, and they they are discussing larger plants, uh, but they have thought about SMRs for a, another region of the country. But they have at Veracruz, another potential site that was selected long, long time ago, for a new larger nuclear power plant. And one thing that I forgot to mention um, of Argentina is, because I, I mentioned life extension for, for uh, Brazil and Mexico, Argentina Embalsi plant, the Kandu design, has already undergone life, life extension as well. And Atucha 1 is in process. Now Argentina is doing the analysis portion to, to go through life extension of Atucha 1. They have extended for five years to go to the process of uh, analysis and, and, and understand what are the, the changes they are gonna need to implement, but they, have, they are going to the process to a bigger life extension for Atucha 1, and 2 is gonna come much later uh, because Atucha 2 is, is very recent uh, gone and start operation. Uh, but all three countries that have nuclear power in, in Latin America, Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina, have gone through or are going through life extension of the plants, of the nuclear power plants. So just to summarize, because I don't want to uh, uh, stay too much. Uh, one thing that I like to say is it's very common, especially when we are talking about nuclear and seeing the big plants that UK have and, and France has, that we will overlook that region, especially because Latin America region, especially because it's two reactors here, three reactors here. But as I showed, uh, there is a very robust nuclear industry in those countries. Brazil is one of the five countries that have domain of the whole full cycle of, of like from mining to fuel fabrication uh, uh, and, and having uranium, uh, being rich in uranium as well. Um, Argentina is a technology exporter, as I said. So Latin America uh, is important to see not only as a place that needs support to continue development, also a lot to offer and collaborate with the industry globally. Uh, for example, one thing that came out of the unfortunate delay on the plants in Brazil is we became very good at maintaining equipments. There are equipments in, in the site of Angra Tree that were received in the 80s for putting in the plant um, that has not started operation yet in 2022. So you would think that these equipments, they are already 40 something years old, that they would have to go through to undergo life extension now, right? It, because they would be this all this time in operation. And because of trying to maintain that asset for, for the plant, uh, Brazilians, the, the industry in Brazil develop a capability of uh, maintaining this sort of equipment such a way that IEA often invites Brazilian experts uh, in missions of the IEA to talk about this, to support other countries that need this, this sort of capability. Um, it's an unfortunate that we need to develop this capability because ideally the plant would have been constructed in the past, but this is something that Brazil has this unique capability that is supporting other countries that need that. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to emphasize that. And this is me in front of the two uh, reactors in Angra. And Angra 3 is gonna be on my right. Um, cannot be seen on that photo, but yeah. It is all three places, all three countries have gorgeous uh, sites. I'm biased, but the Brazilian one is the most beautiful one. <laughs> and there is beaches around, a lot of turtles like the warm water, water that is uh, uh, coming from the plants. Um, it is part of, there is islands that you can scuba diving close, uh, close to the plants. 
Uh, so if you ever go to Brazil, make sure you visit the plants there and stay a weekend so you can go around and have a swim with the turtles or the plants. Thank you. Thanks, Alice. That was a really, really interesting talk. It's just um, really good to know about the, the current situation of nuclear power in Latin America. And also, all of these plan, planned nuclear plants are like really interesting, actually. Um, and like you say, I do think it's a bit underrepresented, especially when you're in Europe and things. So that's really interesting um, to learn about. Thanks. Uh, we've got one question in the chat so far. If anybody else has some questions, please pop them in the chat or you can raise your hand um, and I'll meet yourself or if you're in the room, you can just uh, have a look over here. Um, so I'll just read this one out first of all. So this one's from Eduardo. It says, are there examples of collaboration between Latin American countries and are there prospects for future? I know you address this a bit with, with Brazil and Argentina checking each other's um, designs, but yeah, if there's anything to elaborate. Yeah, so there is, um, there is, how Brazil and Argentina collaborate. Um, also, as I said, like NASA inspectors, NASA utility inspectors inspect uh, uh, goals to for, and this is not an inspection on, on nuclear materials, it's like few inspections and so on, a, a proper service at the, the, the plant during outages, for example. So they do that uh, in Brazil as well. There is uh, other aspects of collaboration outside of nuclear power. Uh, nuclear medicine, the IEA has a region that is called ARCAL, and there is a project that's called ARCAL, which is Latin American Caribbean. So there are projects focused on this region. Uh, there, there has from ranges of training and um, uh, uh, nuclear medicine and uh, development and a, a lot of things that has the support of the IEA for that specific region. There was uh, there was recently, uh, three years ago, some something like that, a focus on developing new leaderships in that region. And so they, they did, uh, under this project, ARCAL, they did a, a whole leadership training for uh, people in nuclear uh, for Latin America. It was only focused on, on the Latin America region. So only people from that region could participate with the IEA. Uh, there is also discussion on supporting different business. There is uh, INB, which enriches uranium, has sold uh, uranium for Argentina. Although Argentina doesn't use uh, enriched uranium because they are heavy water reactors, uh, they have, there, there is a, a benefit of slightly enriching going from uh, 0 0.7 to uranium-235, which is what the percentage that we find in the, na in, in the, in the mines and in the nature, uh, going from 0 .7, 0 0.7 to 0 0.85 of enrichment. So there is like a, a, a benefit for energy production. And, and this uh, INB could, uh, could do for, for Argentina and transport it. This is likely enrich the uranium or the Argentinian facilities. Uh, even through land. So we, there are trucks going through Brazil up to Argentina with this likely enriched uranium. So there is a lot of, there is, there, we try to have a lot of collaboration between the countries. There is, of course, um, different levels of, of uh, uh, development. So as, as I show Argentinian from the three countries that have nuclear power, the Argentinian industry is the most robust up to the point that they are exporting technology. Uh, Mexico is the least one in, in terms of nuclear power. And then you can look at the nuclear medicine, um, which it then comes a bunch of other countries together as well. And Bolivia is the one that it's starting right now with the support of the Russians because the Russians were financing as well. I'm not sure how this project is going on with, with everything that is happening at this moment. So I understand that might be a question. I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. That's a really, really comprehensive answer. That, yeah, a lot of collaboration sounds like it's going on, actually. Um, and Eduardo says thank you. Uh, is there anybody else who has any questions? Uh, there's one from in the room here. Um, yeah, if you want to just... Just, just, a, just a quick one from the, the prospects of SMRs. I know the Argentinians are working on the car M design. 
do you, do you think that would um, have a market within Brazil to supply the, the kind of small regional hubs of power that that you talked about? Well, yeah, Brazil. One thing that I that I didn't mention, Brazil is developing a, a reactor as well, but it's not it's not an SMR per se. Uh, it is we are developing our nuclear submarine, right? Brazil doesn't have any nuclear submarine, which is a strategy for any country um, because the one of the weakness of the submarine is when it surfaces. So if you don't have a nuclear submarine, it cannot stay that long below water, that's a weakness of, of military. So Brazil is developing its own uh, nuclear reactor for the submarine. Uh, so it is looking at how can we do that? If, unfortunately, there was no, that in this specific, there is not much collaboration because it is supposed to be military use, although it is just energy production. But um, Brazil is also trying to learn from that about an SMR technology. What Brazil and Argentina can definitely work on cutting is something that we are following in Brazil, following very closely. And definitely Argentina will, based on, on their expertise, they will wanna market that. Uh, they already market research reactors, but Brazil is, is a very not willing to take risks sort of country in terms of technology. So for SMRs, for example, we want a proven technology. Uh, so it's going to take a while for Karin to show uh, the, what it is and, and how it's operating and so on. Uh, so I don't know if mean, meanwhile there's other technologies in SMR that are advancing faster uh, that can be forced to the point, the point. And another thing that we need to be concerned is we need financing for those investments and, and so on. And some other countries there are marketing SMR technology can also bring in financing for, for developing that in these other countries. So that is something that like Argentina did with, with China for constructing a new plant. They went with China because they will finance everything for, for the Walong design. So if there is another technology that Brazil is willing to go and then can bring also financing, it probably, and that's my personal opinion, it probably will have um, will be like prioritized instead of the Argentinian technology. But definitely something that Brazilians and Argentinians are discussing. Uh, we want to see we want to see this technology work. Um, but yeah, we need to we need to take these other points into consideration first. Great, thanks very much, Alice. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? I just have one quick one myself. Um, you mentioned that um, Brazil is quite unique, that they have, you know, uh, most of the entire fuel cycle, fuel cycle for nuclear um, covered in the country. I was wondering um, wh where they're going with their, like, final disposal of, their, of the nuclear waste. Like, do they have any uh, geological disposal facility or, like, options at the moment? Um, and yeah, yeah, so we currently have dry casks for temporary uh, disposal. And there is a project called Centena, which is the project for the definite disposal of the, of the waste. It is, there is not a selected place yet and the, the project is not completely developed, but it is within the government and within a, a laboratory in Brazil, they are developing that project. And then they are talking to several other countries um, there are also working on this. They are using IEA resources as well to connect with what other countries are doing. So we don't have yet defined uh, the location, uh, but there is uh, ongoing research on, on uh, where we are gonna put it and how it's gonna be. Meanwhile, we have finalized several um, few movements to put um, a burnt fuel from the pools at Angra into dry casks. And these dry casks are also at the site in Angra. Cool, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, all right, we'll move on um, to our next speaker now. Uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Jeremy Rayner. 
he'll be giving a talk on small modular, modular reactors in Canada. So uh, Jeremy is the director of Johnson Strama Graduate School for Public Policy at the University of uh, Saskatchewan and is visiting as uh, a visiting research fellow at the Dalton Nuclear Institute. Uh, his work focuses on theories of policy process, particularly policy learning and policy change, as well as policy analysis, governance and resonance, energy and environmental policy. He is currently undertaking research on the policy environment for the development and deployment of um, SMRs in the UK as part of a larger comparative study. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the, uh, to the daughter for uh, the invitation to be here. Um, and thank you once again to my uh, sponsor, um, the Sylvia Fedoric Canadian Centre for Nuclear Innovation, who've uh, made this trip possible. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, as the subtitle suggests, about policy and politics. Um, it's nice to be with an audience for which I don't have to explain what an SMR is. Uh, but on the other hand, I have very little knowledge beyond uh, the, that uh, in terms of these designs. So please don't uh, ask me questions uh, about the, uh, the reactors themselves. As a political scientist, I couldn't possibly uh, answer them. I am uh, really just one step uh, above the YouTuber whom I heard the other day describe the point of power generation as to get the owns out of the gate. Um, so um, uh, I will, since time is a bit short, uh, I will uh, skip over some of the theory that uh, I had uh, wanted to, uh, to talk about at the start of this presentation. I'm happy to share my slides or discuss this. Um, but uh, this particular work um, builds on two, um, two studies, very different studies. Uh, one, a much older one of, of um, policy making and particularly of gender setting in the United States by John Kingdon, published in the 1990s. Um, Kingdon uh, really popularized uh, the idea that in contrast to uh, traditional theories of public administration and public policy, um, the policy process doesn't really begin with a problem to which policymakers try to find the appropriate solution and implement it. Um, problems and solutions in Kingdon's view exist in parallel streams. Um, solutions, for example, uh, technologies like SMRs, uh, are kept alive in a, in a solution stream uh, until events in a third or, uh, or, or politics stream uh, open what Kingdon calls a policy window, um, which will remain open for a time, um, in which uh, the solution, in this case the SMR, uh, will, will, see, will be seen to be um, a, a politically desirable uh, way of tackling a problem that has, uh, has risen excuse me, up the policy agenda. Um, slightly contradictory to that view is a study that many of you will know, uh, contains an, an excellent chapter on UK uh, nuclear policy uh, by Keith Baker and Jerry Stoker, which uh, points out that there is um, a kind of irremediable materiality to uh, energy policy in general and nuclear uh, policy in particular, you can tell as many stories and do as much framing work about in the energy policy field as you like, but eventually concrete has to be poured, uh, metal has to be forged, operators have to be trained and so forth, and that uh, is the business of government and governance, uh, and it's where, um, in their view, um, nuclear policy in country after country has come up short uh, over the years. Um, they have, uh, I'll skip across that one, um, the left-hand slide, which will be, the left-hand part of the slide, which will be very familiar to many of you, um, is really their, their sort of problem uh, framing, that um, uh, nuclear power in the United Kingdom, in this particular case, which was supposed to um, provide an ever-increasing share of uh, power generation, has over the past 30 years actually declined as a proportion of, uh, of uh, power generation uh, by source. Uh, the right hand um, uh, you know, graph, which um, obviously is slightly different for a reason, um, looks at Canada's energy use generally. Um, and you'll see, however, that uh, the situation of nuclear is much the same, um, that it reached a peak in the late 1980s um, and has been stable, but not increasing uh, ever since then as, as a, as a uh, proportion 
of Canada's energy use. Um, that very important part of the bottom uh, graph, uh, the, the bottom part of that right-hand graph, showing um, the, the role of oil, fairly steady but large, um, and the dramatic increase in the, the use of natural gas as, a, as an energy source uh, is important for understanding um, what is going to happen uh, to, to SMRs in Canada. Um, I should add that this, is, this talk is by way of an apology uh, to anyone who's ever heard me talk about SMRs before. Um, when I first started studying this topic, I was very much a skeptic. Um, I am on record as saying that I don't believe that SMRs will ever be uh, deployed on the ground in Canada or indeed anywhere else. Um, but um, events, particularly in Canada over the last few, uh, last couple of years, um, uh, have, I think, proved me wrong. And I'm now a cautious optimist that we will see uh, actual SMRs built and deployed in Canada um, during the next decade. And I'll try and explain why uh, today. So um, here's an essential piece of background about the Canadian situation. Power generation is a constitutionally protected uh, right of the provinces in Canada. There is no such thing as really Canadian power generation. It's 10 provinces and three territories. Um, and they have very different uh, power generation mixes. The only thing you need to see on this rather busy slide uh, is um, you need to, to, to look at is the size of the pie, which is the, the amount of power generated in this province, uh, and the slices of the pie, which are the source. So blue is um, hydroelectric power, uh, red is nuclear, um, black is coal, and gray is, is, is gas. Uh, yellow is biomass and green is, is wind and solar. And um, you will see that there are then two nuclear provinces in, in Canada, Ontario, which generates rather more than half its, its power from, from nuclear, uh, the CANDU reactors, and um, New Brunswick, which has uh, CANDU uh, technology as well, um, but where nuclear is part of a more complex uh, mix. The other thing to note about this is the difference between what we call in Canada the hydro provinces, notably uh, Quebec, uh, British Columbia, uh, but also Manitoba, uh, New Newfoundland and Ontario, um, and the fossil provinces, uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, my own uh, province, and uh, to a lesser extent Nova Scotia in, in, in the Maritimes. So there are a number of provinces which are just completely uninterested in SMRs for very straightforward reasons. They can produce as much clean energy as, as, as they like um, with existing hydro capacity. And in fact, they produce more than they need and export the, the excess to the United States very lucratively. Um, however, um, there are at least a couple of provinces um, where uh, the CANDU reactors are coming to the end of their lives. A decision has been made to extend those lives through refurbishment, but not to build new large reactors. Ontario and New Brunswick, um, and provinces where in order to meet uh, or to help Canada meet uh, clean energy targets, um, uh, we will have to, to end reliance on power generation by coal and, uh, and, and gas. Um, and to add to that, of course, um, uh, the, the, the role of the oil sands generally in, uh, in Canada's GHG emissions pictures. So um, from this uh, uh, graphic, you'll be perhaps unsurprised to learn that um, there are four provinces interested in, uh, in uh, building SMRs. They are Ontario, New Brunswick, Saskatchewan, and uh, they have been joined by uh, Alberta. Um, and again, rather unusually for the Canadian context, this has been facilitated by the federal government, but the federal government, even though uh, it has responsibility in Canada for anything to do with the uranium life cycle from mining to waste disposal. Um, um, the, the, there is the, the, the role of the federal government has been generally facilitated, with one exception that I'll, I'll talk about uh, in a moment. So large nuclear um, in Canada has stalled for all of the reasons outlined by uh, Baker and Hacker in terms of the governance challenges of, of new nuclear. There's no nuclear interest from the hydro uh, provinces. But the clean energy agenda has this interesting uh, twist that um, Canada has struggled. I could show a, a number of very embarrassing graphics here. Canada has adopted 
uh, target after target for uh, GHG emissions reductions and has missed every single one of them, is on course to miss the next one. Uh, and the principal reason for that has been that the growth of emissions in the oil sands has completely outstripped the reductions of emissions in the rest of the country. This has not, as you can imagine, made Alberta particularly popular in the rest of Canada, um, but uh, it's part of the, the kind of provincial mythology of Alberta that they are misunderstood by the rest of Canada and they don't care uh, about this. So the federal government is reasonably serious about emissions reductions, but this is the sort of thing, of course, that it has to deal with. Many of you will have seen these pictures from earlier this year. Uh, of the so-called Freedom Convoy that made its way to uh, Ottawa and uh, occupied the centre of Ottawa um, until it was forcibly removed. Um, protesting in this particular case, um, vaccine, uh, COVID-19 pandemic measures. Um, you may ask, well, what is the, uh, the connection between uh, public health and nuclear energy? All each of the four provinces that I've talked about as being interested in SMRs uh, is governed by a conservative government, which in the Canadian context means a right of centre government. Compared even with Europe, but certainly compared with much of the rest of the world, Canadian politics is very centrist. There is a right of centre conservative party, there is a left of centre new democratic party, and there's a pragmatic centrist party, the Liberals, whose political philosophy might be summarized as that of Captain Renault in, in uh, Casablanca. You may remember he explains uh, to the Germans that uh, he, uh, he bends to the prevailing wind and the prevailing wind at that time came from Vichy. Uh, the same could be said of, of the Liberals in Canada, not Vichy of course, but uh, the, um, whatever the prevailing wind is, whether it's slightly to the right or slightly to the left, they go in that direction and they have very successfully dominated Canadian politics for most of Canada's uh, existence. Um, the problem that causes for other political parties, and we'll think about parties on the right at the moment, is they have to maintain touch with their base at the same time as trying to maintain touch with the centre of Canadian politics. So it's a kind of stretch act, and the Liberals will do everything in their powers to make that as difficult as possible. Um, and we have experienced in Canada the um, the drawback of this kind of consensus politics that um, people are, who are partisan on the right or the left of the political spectrum will often have the impression that mainstream Canadian politics has no place for them. Um, we saw that with the Occupy movement in the 2010s on the left, uh, and we have seen it now recently with uh, the, the Freedom Convoy movement uh, on the right. So. These conservative premiers, interestingly enough, um, were in, in the forefront of em embracing vaccination as the solution to the pandemic. And the reason for that is, of course, on the right, any other kind of um, policy measure which requires any sort of behavioral change mandated by government um, is opposed as an intrusion into basic freedoms of, of people. Um, and there's a similar dynamic at work, I think, in connection with climate change. SMRs, if you like, are the vaccination of clean energy uh, as far as uh, these conservative provinces are concerned. Um, they will not have to ask their, uh, their citizens to uh, make the behavioral changes that many of us believe will be necessary if we're actually gonna tackle climate change if they have a domestic source of clean energy. Uh, that they can produce and can be consumed at the same levels that are currently being consumed in Canada. And that's why we have an open policy window in Canada right now for, uh, for, for SMRs. And the key questions then are how long will it remain open? And is that enough time to build and deploy SMRs in sufficient numbers? So the policy window, if you like, is going to replace the picture that you see out of, the, the, out of that window with, uh, with uh, clean energy. Um, so, as I said, the, the, the process in Canada has been very grounded. The federal government has used its coordinating capacity to, um, to, to develop a process in which we've seen an SMR roadmap, a memorandum of understanding between the uh, four provinces concerned, uh, a feasibility study which looked at the costs and, and benefits of, of SMRs, um, and just a couple of weeks ago, a strategic plan 
which was oddly named. It wasn't really a strategic plan. It was more a kind of update to work done on, on SMRs. Uh, there's been startup funding provided by both levels of government. And most recently in the strategic plan, we've seen the provinces now calling for more federal funding um, and rather worryingly expedited regulatory approval from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission for new SMR designs. And what we see is uh, three tracks in Canada. Uh, the first track I think likely to be, is, is to my mind the most plausible and likely to actually deliver SMRs on the ground. Um, this is a collaboration between Ontario and Saskatchewan in which there'll be a managed competition, um, there has been, sorry, a managed competition um, of designs with a short list of three that was chosen. Um, and the winner of that competition was the GE Hitachi BWRX 300 uh, design, a boiling water reaction of extremely conventional design. Um, the idea here is to get it through the regulatory process as quickly as possible uh, by not having any features that the CNSC or ring alarm bells with the CNSC. Um, the first will be built at an existing nuclear site in Darlington to avoid any kind of uh, issues with site approvals. Um, and they plan to have this in, in place by 2028 um, for um, Ontario PowerGen as, as its customer. If all goes according to plan, if no, no cost overruns and other issues are, um, um, are revealed, then Saskatchewan has undertaken to order three or perhaps even four of these reactors to be, to be deployed in the 2030s. And we can start to think about how the modularity part of SMRs would actually be uh, implemented. So a long way ahead, I think of many of these, let's build one SMR and see what, uh, what, what happens. New Brunswick, a totally different track, a much murkier process that resulted in two invitations to, uh, to vendors to build reactors in, uh, in New Brunswick. Um, one, uh, the ARC-100, which is based on the experimental breeder reactor, um, a, a molten salt design, I believe, that um, uh, was uh, developed at the Argonne Laboratories in the United States. Um, and um, a Moltex, a UK uh, design, um, the stable salt uh, reactor, which is supposed to have an output of about 300 megawatts, but since it remains a somewhat conceptual and often changing design, it's hard to say what, uh, what that's actually going to, to be. There are no firm dates to the New Brunswick uh, process. There's much more novelty, obviously, in the designs. More concerns from the CNSC have already been expressed. And there's a lot of, to my mind, a lack of clarity about who's going to buy these. It's not clear that New Brunswick Power is going to buy them. Um, it's not clear what the, uh, the market otherwise will be. In the case of uh, GE Hitachi, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the, the wider market that in a second. And there's a third track which um, is, is, is going ahead. Um, this is one where the federal government will be directly involved because the market here is in the north of Canada, uh, in the territories um, and um, Again, it was unclear how the choice of reactor was, was arrived at, um, but there has been a decision to build a Westinghouse Evinci five megawatt design, uh, the kind that can be put on the back of a truck and, uh, and delivered. Um, and it will be built at the old Chalk River uh, facility uh, by 2026 um, added. I mentioned this to somebody uh, in the UK, I, who shall be nameless uh, a short while ago. Uh, and he nearly fell off his chair laughing uh, <laughs> with the idea that, uh, that we, this would actually be built by 2026. But then that's, that's a date, they've committed to it, they're gonna have a go at it, uh, and we'll see whether they can actually do this. So um, my final slide to, to, uh, to conclude then, you know, this window I think is open as long as storage for intermittence remains expensive and cumbersome. Um, so if that problem is solved, quite independently of what's going on in the SMR. This window is gonna close relatively quickly. Um, SMRs are going to lose a great deal of their market for uh, grid scale applications. Um, the coordination policy tools have obviously been employed in Canada, I think to very, very good effect, but it does remain to be seen how much governments are prepared to use their authority and their financial power to, uh, to, to, to make SMRs happen. The process is very, very vulnerable to changes in government. I think uh, it's possible uh, you here in the UK, I hear complaints about governments chopping and changing with respect to nuclear policy. 
Imagine if instead of having one government or perhaps four uh, governments, five governments, you had 11. And you know that's that's what we have in, in, in Canada. There's always an election going on somewhere in, in, in some points, some parts of Canada, and governments change and their commitments change and so forth. Um, the New Brunswick track, I have to say, looks like a bit of an ill-thought-out diversion. It's obviously driven very much by the uh, innovation uh, agenda rather than the power generation agenda. And whether a province that is the size of Scotland and whose population is roughly one third that of Greater Manchester could actually be a kind of nuclear powerhouse in terms of innovation. Fantastic ambition, but you know whether that actually is going to, 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 to be realized, very hard to say. Um, and even for the, for the, for the main track, I don't think there's a big enough market in Canada for true SMR production on a production line. And this will depend very much then on development south of the border. And that's why I think the GE Hitachi and the Western House designs have actually been chosen because they're looking to an integrated uh, North American market for these uh, SMRs, uh, where Canada will be a, a, a player in that market, just like we are in the automobile. Um, Canada does not build any cars of its own. We build other people's cars and we have a, an export, most of them to the United States. And we um, have a very flourishing auto parts manufacturing industry. Most of those parts are sold directly to the United States for, 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 for building cars. So I suspect something of the same is in people's minds for SMRs. And I have to say that's a very plausible scenario. We've shown that it can work. With, uh, with also, we have uh, trade connections. We have NAFTA um, in terms of in, in, in place, uh, or NAFTA two as it as it currently is. So that's why I'm cautiously optimistic about uh, the, the fact that we will actually see uh, SMRs not just built even as first of a kind, but possibly even rolled out um, uh, in, in numbers uh, in Canada. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Jeremy. That was a really fascinating talk. I, I enjoyed that a lot. Um, I'll just have a look if there's any questions. Oh, there's one in the room here from Anita. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the talk. That was really great. I thought kind of linking both the talks together. So mm. You mentioned exporting SMRs to, to North America. Is there scope to go wider field? Alice mentioned before, you know, the need for SMRs in, in Latin America as well. So is there any kind of movement that it could go further? Well, obviously, of course, the, in the various documents, they talk about that, and um, they would like to, to do that. Um, the markets, they seem to think, <laughs> so, um, um, possibly Latin America <laughs> as, a, as a market, uh, possibly Eastern Europe uh, as, uh, as markets. Um, but uh, at the moment, this is all very aspirational. And uh, you know, I think um, China is obviously very... Uh, Far ahead in terms of building SMRs, um, the uh, power it, it will depend very much on the extent to which governments get behind uh, these uh, these products in terms of export credits and, uh, and financing and these sorts of things. So yes, of course, export markets outside of America are in people's minds, but I haven't seen anything concrete that suggests that this is a real possibility for what's going on. Thank you. Um, I can't see any more questions coming in in the chat. If anybody, if anybody wants to raise a hand, then... oh, thank you very much. Are there, are there any indigenous designs coming out of Canada? Are they basically relying on designs coming from North America? Yes, um, the uh, it was in fact somewhat of a surprise that the Ontario government chose the GE factory design because we have uh, terrestrial uh, is a, um, a Canadian operation. Um, but uh, I believe it's another molten salt design. And consequently, I think that's what really made them think that maybe they didn't want to go down that route, um, it, it, given the other considerations that I mentioned. So yes, um, indigenous, of course, has, has a double meaning in Canada. Uh, and in that sense, um, indigenous communities are certainly something where the possibility of, of micro nuclear mm. reactors um, these are often communities that are remote, um, that suffer from energy insecurity and energy poverty, and uh, where it's possible that we might see that as a potential solution. 
there is an engagement process, a discussion process going on with Indigenous communities. The one that comes to my mind is the UK SMR, because that's based on tried and tested PWR technology. It just it's about it's not far off the power output of either our AGRs or your Candy reactors. So yeah. that, that might be an interesting thing, given the kind of historical tie between Canada and Great Britain. Right. We can when we get the demonstrators yeah. of the UK SMR built, then yes. maybe export that to the, if you look actually in the I think it's the 2012 document about the expansion of nuclear in the UK, where they had a map of potential export markets. Mm -hmm. They had a number of kind of shaded areas which were out of bounds, um, in a sense, because they believed that, uh, that, that the governments in those countries would ensure that, that indigenous technology was used over. And Canada was on it. So um, whether that will be different with SMRs, because they were looking for mm -hmm. full-scale reactors, the can do was obviously there. Mm -hmm. so, um, but as, as I say, I think someone has taken a, a, a very, very sensible look at SMRs. Look, who are really going to build this in, in, in scores or hundreds? Um, it's a North American market looking at, not, not a Canadian market. Canadian markets do so. So, from the UK's point of view, we should be looking at North America. Mm -hmm. And that includes Mexico, of course. Cool, thank you very much. Um, it's interesting to get the comparison with the UK there as well. Um, but yeah, I think um, unless there's any more questions coming up, um, then yeah, we'll close off today. I just want to say thanks again very much to uh, Jeremy and Alice, two really brilliant and interesting talks. I loved it a lot. I think if, you know, if anyone has any other questions for them, I'm sure you can find them uh, online for things. And also this talk will be, um, on YouTube for anyone to watch again and access at a later date as well. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Thanks everyone for um, yeah watching and, and your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stop recording. Stop recording. Stop recording.